Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Prehistory in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons and all my channel members from our sister channel over at History in the Dark. You are the reason why this content remains very confusing. And today, we are going to discuss a time where, well, it still happens, but not nearly this bad, generally. The exact layout and, shall we say, function of dinosaur anatomy is a debated topic among paleontology. Sometimes we just don't really know exactly how things went together on a skeleton, or how certain parts of a dinosaur's body may have been used in their behavior. It varies a great deal depending on interpretation. It's only through consistent research and comparisons to modern animals, as well as finding more complete remains, that paleontologists can come to a consensus regarding the behavior of certain dinosaurs. And today we'll discuss a very famous dinosaur, the Stegosaurus. From the time that at least one person thought they could fly? What? Stegosaurus, which means roof lizard, is a four-legged herbivorous armored dinosaur that lived in the late Jurassic period, roughly 150 million years ago. They're astonishingly well known and probably one of the most recognizable dinosaurs out there. This has often led to certain artworks drawing vicious fights between it and Tyrannosaurus Rex because they're both equally famous, but the truth is this absolutely never occurred. Because the T-Rex lived millions of years after Stegosaurus had long disappeared. Fun fact, in terms of time span, the T-Rex is actually closer in history to us than it was to the Stegosaurus. One of those things that just sounds wrong, but it's absolutely true. Stegosaurus is a genus, and it's often characterized by a spike tail and a bunch of plates that line the spine on its back. It was first discovered and identified in the late 1800s during the Bone Wars by Othniel Charles Marsh at Dinosaur Ridge National Park. Stegosaurus as a genus actually has multiple species under it, though only three are officially recognized. Stegosaurus stenops, Stegosaurus sulcatus, and the largest of them, Stegosaurus undulatus. They're also very closely related to other species under the Stegosauridae family, Kentrosaurus, Giganspinosaurus, Chunkingosaurus, the list goes on. There's actually quite a number of these, but the ones we really want to talk about are the core Stegosaurus genus. Though they didn't fight Tyrannosaurus, because they couldn't have, they definitely squared off with Allosaurus. Fossil evidence once found a puncture wound from a Stegosaurus spike impact in an Allosaurus's tail vertebrae, proving that the Stegosaurus did use their spikes for defense, as there was one time where they thought they mainly were only for display, as some paleontologists believe they'd be too fragile for this purpose. But the dermal plates are the things that really confused people. Even Marsh wasn't really sure how they went together at first. He thought they actually laid flat on the Stegosaurus back, and it was only through further analysis of the remains that it was discovered that they must have been held upright. But even then, no one was really sure exactly how they fit for a long time, whether they were symmetrical, raised in pairs, or whether they alternated position, and it seems to be a mix of the two. Through finding more complete remains, it seems that the tail and neck plates tend to line up in pairs, but once the larger plates entered the back area, they started to alternate a little bit more. This isn't the only controversial opinion of the Stegosaurus, as it was once thought that they had two brains. Yes, really. Between their hips was a very spacious area, and no one could really figure out, even now, exactly what would have gone there. And it was thought their brains would have been way too small to handle their large bodies, so they needed a second brain of sorts that would have been responsible mostly for handling the nervous system, while the tiny brain in the head did all the thinking. But further research has shown that their brains weren't actually that small, and they would have been large enough to function. They weren't exactly geniuses by any stretch of the imagination. The brains were still fairly tiny, but not so tiny they would have needed two of them. But back to the plates. Their function. What were they for? Marsh believed they were for defense, but some argued they would have been too fragile for this, and perhaps they were more responsible for thermoregulation, or even display, to attract a mate, or simply for species identification. It could have been a mix of all these things. Further analysis has shown that the plates would have been covered in keratin, 
The same stuff that makes up our hair, nails, and when it comes to birds, feathers, and claws. It's tough material, and it would have strengthened the plates quite a bit while the stegosaurs were alive. So they could have served to protect to a certain degree, from downward bites from allosaurs, for example. Even though their sides were exposed, they still had those tail spikes that they could swing back and forth, and with a surprising amount of range, so it wasn't like they were completely defenseless. They were also thought to be herd animals, so safety in numbers as well. But there was one man who had the most interesting interpretation of the stegosaurus plates. At no point was this ever taken seriously, and I want to stress that right now. As I've read many an article believing that <laughs> scientists used to think this. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Real paleontologists who really studied this stuff never at all took this hypothesis seriously because it makes no sense. So I don't want to pretend like this was ever something that was legitimately considered. However, it was proposed and someone really genuinely thought that this might actually be the case when it comes to the Stegosauruses. The gentleman went by the name W.H. Ballou, and he was a writer and dinosaur enthusiast who lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Ballou was not a scientist at all. His fascination with paleontology was purely a hobby, and it was something he liked to read about and think about. And there's nothing wrong with any of that, but he decided to write an article with his own hypothesis regarding the function of the stegosaurus plates. For a long time, some paleontologists believed that the plates were more flexible, able to move around and help deflect attacks to a certain degree. Nowadays, it's believed that no, they weren't really flexible in any way, but that on its own wasn't the silliest thought. Baloo's thought, on the other hand, took this well in the direction of just pure insanity. He thought that the plates were big enough and flexible enough that the Stegosaurus could use them to glide. As he put it, crude aeroplane or glider as the Stegosaur was, the principle of all flight was there in the parallel rows of flaps upon his back. Certainly, he was the factory in which the first bird was built. Blue carried his thoughts forward by arguing the point that the stegosaur does have a lot in common with birds in terms of bone structure, particularly in the hips, as many dinosaurs do, because they are an evolutionary step towards modern birds. That part is correct. That doesn't mean they could fly, though. And the vast majority of dinosaurs couldn't fly. See this? This isn't a dinosaur. This is a flying reptile. Regular dinosaurs, for the most part, couldn't fly. It was a heavy, bulky, terrestrial creature, and even if those spikes were somehow lighter or wings, they are way too tiny to gain flight. At all. Any paleontologist could have told him he was wrong, and in fact, any aeronautical engineer could have told him he was wrong. But he still published the thought anyway. Even though there was no scientific evidence for this opinion, it was just something he thought about and genuinely believed in. I'm all for imagination and coming up with new ideas, and in fact, to be a paleontologist, you have to have a lot of imagination, because the only thing we have to work with are the bones we find in the ground. And in many cases, one of the reasons why the Stegosaurus in particular was debated so hotly over the last century is that when you find dinosaur remains in the ground, more often than not, they're either incomplete or completely out of order or both. The movement of the Earth itself shifts these bones around. They usually do not stay in one spot. You very rarely find a completely intact skeleton with all the bones in the exact position they were when the animal died. But incredibly, Baloo's ill-advised thought actually influenced a work of fiction by Edgar Rice Burroughs, one of the most beloved authors in history. He put this interpretation of Stegosaurus in his 1929 novel, Tarzan at the Earth's Core. Though in Edgar Rice Burroughs' defense, this was a work of fiction, not actually attempting to be based off fact. So I don't want to come down on him too hard, and I wouldn't even come down that hard on Baloo. It's one thing to suggest an idea, but Baloo really sincerely believed in it to the point of getting it published in an article for people to read. I'm not saying he doesn't have the right to speak his mind, but I guess the lesson here is whenever you read something from any source, remember to consider the source. Baloo was not a scientist, he was not a paleontologist, he was a writer who really liked dinosaurs. And he's totally entitled to have whatever ideas he has, but unless actual paleontologists who actually get paid to study this stuff went to many years of higher education to learn and understand why things go together the way they do, actually step up and verify a hypothesis through further research, don't actually take it at face value. 
is kind of what I'm saying. Fortunately for Baloo, though, not many people actually took this seriously. And no one in the modern age ever thinks of this when they think of Stegosaurus. They think of this. And this is probably fairly correct, so we like that. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.